Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So, in today's video, we're going to be talking about something a little bit interesting. Now, this comes from my own observations of, of the psyche, of um, sort of active imagination, daily fantasies, things like that. Um, I'm generally quite an imaginative person, so I can have fantasies pretty spontaneous fantasies even just when i'm walking even when um sometimes when i'm talking with other people although of course talking with other people generally uh sees my attention focused on them rather than on fantasies but sometimes occasionally you may have a um a particular fantasy pop up even when you're talking to someone and specifically, maybe not so a fantasy, but certainly a conscious image or, or sort of like a pre-conscious image um, within your mind. And uh, I get that a lot, and I know that other people will be able to experience that as well, if, of course, they direct their attention towards it. So... Obviously, in Jungian psychology, for to give you an example, uh, you might be talking to someone about something in particular, and uh, it might just touch upon a certain archetypal theme. And then you might be um, predisposed to having an image in your psyche at that time of a personalized image of the father in the form of a father transference. So for myself, I often see when um, I'm in that kind of father transference um, mode, I suppose, or archetypal, you can't really call it archetypal possession, but archetypal behavior, I suppose you could call it, or archetypal feeling. Um, I will often see Jung, of course, in my psyche, uh, I sometimes see Charles Bukowski, I sometimes see Alan Watts, I've talked about this before, and when, when I say that I see that person in my psyche, it's very um, passive, so it's not that of course when I'm talking to someone, I can clearly see that person in my psyche, and that, psych that person pops up in a very, very clear image. It's just behind consciousness and it's very hard to get access to. But of course, once you get access to it, you can start to recognize it, discern it from reality, realize then where it is possibly affecting your behavior in that moment. And then you can start to center yourself again. It is hard and it does take a lot of uh, what we could call psychic energy, mental energy, whatever. Um, and concentration, of course. So, I want to talk about sort of this personalized aspect of a psyche that is very, very interesting. Now, Jung in his writings, a lot of the time focuses on the collective. And as far as I'm aware, I believe it was from uh, Gerthard Adler, uh, I might be pronouncing his name slightly wrong there, but he was a close collab collaborator with Jung, and he edited certainly a fair few of the collected works, if not all of them, uh, along with uh, another of the psychiatrists close to Jung, I forget his name. Um, and he said in an interview, in a Remembering Jung interview, that Jung would focus in his analysis of of patients and of clients, the archetypal side, the collective side, and Tony Wolf would focus on the personal side, and that would be the kind of split, which of course is quite a nice split. Uh, and in his writings, in Jung's writings, he does focus a lot on the collective, and not so much on the personal. And I think that really... Other people, of course, have, have expanded the personal a little bit more. But I think it's necessary to expand the personal more and more and more over the coming years because, of course, 
that was missing in Jung's writings. And uh, I think it's necessary as compensation to be able to do that, to be able to formulate those kind of distinctions and be able to uh, then, of course, expand our understanding. So that's what I'm going to do today, or hopefully do today in a, in a, in a sort of partial way. Now, I, in university, have only just started looking into the brain, into neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, physiology, things like that. But it's always been blatantly apparent to me, before I knew anything about neuroanatomy or anything like that, uh, just on a kind of passive observation of nature and a philosophical intuition, shall we say, um, what Jung would call an intellectual intuition, that the brain, everyone's brains are uh, structured in a unique way to them. And of course, one of the first things you learn, and it's on, it's in some uh, neuropsychology textbooks, uh, neuropsychology books, beginners books, and things like that. Um, I think specifically as well as the, of the one by Dr. Nikki Haynes, Your Brain and You, which is a brilliant introduction, introductory book to neuropsychology. Um, in fact, it, that book, when I read it, went into, into more detail on the brain than uh, in some areas, um, of course, in other areas it didn't, but in some areas than certain things we did in the, the entire semester that I've just had of, of neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. Um, and so obviously in as well, leading on, not only from those books, is it uh, very, very early on mentioned that every brain in the world is unique because, and it's not hard to work out from a philo philosophical or intuitive perspective because of course, you can look at everyone and everyone's physiology is, is subtly different. Of course, identical twins and things like that. Um, but ultimately, uh, even identical twins, environmental factors and things like that shape their physiology, shape their anatomy. Of course, identical twins could um, get different illnesses and things like that. And of course, that's going to affect their physiology and anatomy and brain structure um, in various different ways. So um, with all brains being unique, with all brains having that kind of, um, I don't know, we, 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 I suppose we could use the word a priori kind of um, way of being or mode of being or, or, or growth, that kind of a priori growth, um, then we have to understand that, of course, and this is very, very true in, Jung, in, in a Jungian sense, that the collective, the anima, the animus, the shadow, the persona, things like this, get placed within an individual context. And that is very true. And we are all in our physiology, in our, well, I should say really our physiognomy, our um, speech, the way in which we speak, the, the tones of our voice, all of the different nuances physically and uh, psychologically within our individualized structure of the brain, we produce the collective structures in a personalized way. I am coming across right now as a personalized version of the archetypes. I'm not coming across as a collective version wholly. Of course, the, the personal fits within the collective, but the personal is still very, very much there. And so, yes, I could say, well, I am very much the collective archetype. So let's say uh, I have the ability of that expression through me quite unconsciously. Um, but ultimately, uh, that's happening in an unconscious way by the self um, in a personalized manner or through a personalized vessel in which can never be anything other than a personalized vessel. So, of course, it really interested me when I started to get some active imagination and some visions centered around Doctor Who. Now, anyone who knows me will know I adore Doctor Who. I've watched it since I was nine years old. And, uh, of course, increasingly, it's been apparent in uh, my active imagination, in my dreams, 
in my self observations that Doctor Who is working um, with alchemical symbolism, with mythological motifs, um, by the psyche. The psyche is using that individualized memories, the individualized memories I have of Doctor Who, uh, to structure uh, my psychological development and to uh, portray to me certain archetypal themes that either I might be lacking, either might be too prominent in my psyche, or might be uh, something that particularly I'm, I'm for some reason I'm unconscious of, or some sort of uh, direction I, I need to go go down or go towards. And that's very interesting. Now, of course, I won't go into the symbolism of Jungian psychology or the symbolism well, yeah, I suppose the symbolism of Jungian psychology in Doctor Who. Uh, I will do that at some point. I do have a plan to do a video on that at some point. I do want to do that for the entirety of the modern era of Doctor Who. So what I would do if I was doing that was I would go through each series of Doctor Who and I would get a notepad and I would write down on each episode when I'm watching it all the different Jungian concepts I can see. Now, of course, when I'm watching TV, when Doctor Who or, or anything else, I do pick up very, very easily on uh, even some of the subtleties of Jungian psychology, some of the subtle concepts that I notice with regards to um, even just very, very subtleties of the animo or the animus and things like that, or um, subtleties of uh, an ant the enantiodroma and things like that. and. Um, and I do enjoy picking up on those things. And so it's definitely something I would consider doing uh, in the future with regards to isolating each series and then watching it, pulling out a notebook, writing down all the different things I possibly can, and then dispersing that series by series in a video on here. And uh, I think there'd be some particularly pertinent observations there from a Jungian point of view. Particularly, I could just pull out one or two, I suppose. Um, particularly, we could see the Divine Child in the Doctor and particularly in the Time Lord Victorious and things like that. Uh, and power drives and all, all that sort of um, even more basic um, psychoanalytic themes as well. Not just Jungian themes, but even some Freudian themes. We could see particularly with, with Mickey Smith in sort of season one and two, uh, the Enantiodroma. He, he has an Enantiodromian shift, which is from, of course, this, uh, bumbling idiot who, who doesn't really have so much of an integration with his shadow, maybe a little bit of an integration, but then he gets a full integration with his shadow and he becomes a bloody badass. And so, um, and that's very, very interesting. That's, that's a very nice little theme to pull out. But I won't be going into that in this video. Um, but I will be focusing not solely, um, as we move through this, not solely on, um, my experience with, with, with Doctor Who within my own psyche. But what I really want to highlight is the individualized nature of the archetypal forms. So you, you of course have the archetypes and they are collective. But they're merely a form of expression, an a priori form of expression that is placed within our genetics, our the human geno genome. And uh, the way in which they come to consciousness is through images. Now, the image isn't an archetype, but it is a representation of an archetype or of an archetypal pattern of behavior. Now. Obviously, because all our brains are unique and because in our hippocampuses we've all got different memories and we've got different emotional associations and we've got all sorts of different things going on, those archetypal images, those representations of archetypes, they're going to be different for everyone. And uh, so I could very, very easily postulate and have a very, very strong um, hypothesis around the idea that everyone has this particular mythological substructure that is personalized to them. 
And we could see this most notably because it will be less prominent in those individuals, let's say in big five terms with high conscientiousness and possibly low openness or just generally low trait openness. Um, it'll be less um, obvious in those people because they're less mythological generally and they're, they're less um, focused on creating a mythological story out of their own life. But particularly with people high in trait openness, we could notice this. And uh, I think particularly of people who are very, very absorbed in um, science fiction or things like that, that do really have a story. Not only science fiction, but fantasy. Things like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter and, and things like that. In a way, I suppose that does come into science fiction as well in a, in a small way. Uh, also, definitely things like Star Wars and Star Trek and stuff like that. So uh, I would say that people who, like myself, I'm a big fan of Doctor Who. So, of course, because I watch it so frequently and I've watched, well, I say hundreds, thousands of hours most likely of Doctor Who over the last, well, since I was nine, so over the last 16 years. That really cements that in my hippocampus. That really cements my emotion. At the amount of times that I've watched Doctor Who and I've got this kind of outpouring of emotion because I'm, I'm watching this heroic figure that, of course, I'm making all these projections onto. Father projections, hero projections, all that sort of stuff at a very young age. And I'm getting all this bubbling emotion that's having a physiological reaction on me um, with regards to getting goosebumps and all that sort of stuff. Um, even when, for example, the music comes on, uh, I would sometimes get uh, what's known as musical frisson, which again gives you goosebumps and raises your hair and your hair on your arms and stuff like that. So there's physiological reactions there, which which also ground that memory in the, the body and in the, in, the, in the brain, well, more so in the brain, but of course the brain is connected to the body uh, inextricably. So of course you've got the, the natural kind of, let's say the, the, the nature knowledge of the body there as well. That, that all those things are happening at a young age and over a sustained period of 16 years. So of course, um, you could imagine that there's, there's going to be, um, a, representation of the archetypes in such a personalized way for me uh, with regards to Doctor Who. And as I say, someone else uh, who's done that for Star Wars or someone else who's done that for Star Trek or someone else who's done that for Harry Potter. Harry Potter's another good one because it's a very mythological one. Uh, Lord of the Rings, equally so. All these, any, any of these things, but many, many people do indeed have associations with, they will have that particular uh, mythological substructure in the psyche. Now, can we say that it is for everyone? It is hard to say it's for everyone because, of course, when we're focused on someone with, let's say, low trait openness, you wouldn't really be able to discern whether it's there or not because they're not really the type of person who defines their life on a mythological structure. Now, just because they don't consciously define their life on a mythological structure doesn't mean they don't have dreams that are mythological, uh, mythologically based. And of course, if you were to get them to, if you were to, let's say, uh, say to them, could you tell me when you have a dream? And they write down their dream and they uh, do that for maybe 10 dreams. You will most likely find, even in that individual with low trait openness, that, that there is some sort of basic mythological structure there, even if it is some sort of very, very basic one. And so then we could say, well, even despite the conscious ego not particularly defining their life in mythological terms, there is some sort of basic mythological idea going on in the unconscious. Um, and that might be to do with uh, not necessarily a TV show or anything like that they've seen, although TV shows often do come into dreams, but it may not be that. It may be uh, obviously more personally based, just as uh, even people high in trait openness don't dream of mythological things all the time or, or don't even have active imagination that's solely mythological. It can often be personal as well. It can often be uh, related to the people in their lives and, and, and things like that. 
Um, but I would say to a certain degree, we all do have a certain minor or great, lesser or greater kind of uh, association with these things, even if it isn't um, specifically with a definable show like that. Because I think that it, it's only the case that that comes present in people like myself who have really indulged in one thing for a long time, such as obviously Doctor Who or such as someone else indulging in Star Wars. Those are the people, of course, most likely with high trait openness anyway, because a lot of people who are into sci-fi will have slightly high trait openness. Obviously, some won't, but a lot will. And also, if they are someone who does have exceedingly high trait openness, and of course, has um, uh, indulged in that show in quite a uh abundant way let's say over a number of years then it is very likely the case um that that is very much cemented as a, a personalized mythological form of the archetypes and whenever the archetypes are going to come to consciousness in the form of an image in active imagination or dreams uh then for the most part or for some of the time at least they will come through as that particular tv show now, I want to just clarify that with a little bit more detail, because, of course, I have had dreams, and maybe about once a month. Now, I, I, I dream every night, but maybe about once a month I get a dream centered around Doctor Who, maybe twice a month. Um, and if I'm watching it, of course, it might be more frequently than that. But let's just say I'm not watching it at the time. Then I'll dream once or twice a month about Doctor Who. Now, in my active imagination, it's a bit more frequent. It might be a few times a week in uh, certain fantasies that I may have, either when I'm out walking that just spontaneously pop up, spontaneously arise, maybe in active imagination uh, when I'm doing it on the bed behind me, anything like that. Um, and it will pop up a little bit more frequently. And it strikes me as very, very meaningful, the, the ways in which it pops up. Now, it doesn't just pop up in terms of um, scenes from the show. Sometimes it will. Sometimes my imagination will spontaneously provide me in a kind of uh, meditative or relaxed uh, attitude a, uh, a scene from the show. And it will be a scene from the show. And uh, whenever immediately that scene's come up and then immediately after I've interpreted it, it always strikes me as incredibly relating to the associations I have in my life at that time or the particular uh, overindulgence in certain archetypes. For example, whenever I've been particularly overtaken by the shadow at times, I'll, I've seen all sorts of different images from Doctor Who in my mind that are quite spontaneous that just pop up. Uh, and it's always centered around the master. And it's always centered around John Sims' master. And of course, that he is a, uh, what we, what we could say, uh, as a sort of archetypal in the show. And in, of course, my, my imagination there, it's the boat, the two are synonymous. Uh, it is, of course, an archetypal representation of the shadow. And it's almost the collective shadow as well with the master because the doctor is really a symbol of the self. And it is also a symbol of the, the positive side of the, the wise old man as well. And uh, the master is a, a symbol of the collective shadow, the very instinctual raw shadow. And uh, you, that comes out in his eyes quite a lot. And uh, of course, he has a discount in Missy, but of course, we'll come back to Missy um, because, of course, she would be uh, associated with the shadow side of the, the anima um, in her manifestation. But with regards to um, John Sims Master, we also say that there is a, an association there with the shadow side of the animus. And we see the collective shadow side of the animus coming through in his eyes and his very, very instinctual nature and a very, very assertive manner of wanting to kill people and wanting to... Uh, overcome the world and of course 
there's uh, no better representation than the, the collective shadow. And, and also what it can kind of do in uh, almost a sort of fascist manner, in a sense, is in uh, The End of Time, which where John Sim stands under the arch and converts the entire population of the world, of humans, into him. Uh, and that's a very, very collective shadow thing to do because it's the instincts for power and dominance. And, and there's this very, very interesting side of the shadow within that kind of instinctual um, expression where it wants total power and total unification um, of everything. And... Um, so we see that a lot. We, we, we see that a lot in, in certain motifs and, uh, uh, and this kind of unification in a very, uh, infantile, divine, very, very negative side of the divine child, um, and, uh, a, a, in a unified way of trying to almost replace some of the wholeness that is lost from the, from the fall of the soul to the shadow. Um, and so it's tried to replace that by unifying the world particularly uh, in the image of itself so to try and get some feeling of, of metaphysical closeness with the self or we don't really need to say metaphysical to be honest we could say psychological closeness with the self because that equally equally works there so um of course, you know, I've seen the master and he's popping up uh, in the scene in the end of time where he's laughing in Wilfred's mind, actually. Um, and that also gives us a dual association because we could say, well, when that image pops up in my psyche, we could say the, uh, the shadow is popping up in the, the mind of the wise old man, Wilfred being a, a human manifestation of the, the mana personality really of the, the wise old man in, in a sense, in a sense, uh, not particularly fully, but there is that association that can be made there. And, uh, so we could say that that's the shadow taking over the, the wise old man archetype in its negative form. Uh, and then converting the wise old man into a, um, a, a villain of sorts, an old villain. Um, and, you know, I've got many other associations, um, scenes from the show that have popped up in my mind and, and even, uh, just general scenes that I've created, uh, or that, not that I've created because, of course, it's more spontaneous than that. But sometimes what you do is it can be very spontaneous on the one hand, a lot of the time, and then other times it can be a sort of, uh, moving with the unconscious. So the unconscious might start the image and might kind of spontaneously arise it within you. And then you're kind of almost moving through the images and seeing where it goes. And, and you've got a little bit of slight bit of control there and things like that. And sometimes in active imagination, that's the case. A lot of the time it can be spontaneous, but some of the time it can be like that. And so I've had kind of um, associations and sort of visions that have popped up um, of scenes that, of course, aren't from the show, but of course do reveal to me certain archetypal associations. And of course, we can go into all of the different um, attitudes of uh, the show with... For example, uh, when David Tennant was kind of getting, um, shall we say, enraptured by the anima in Rose, uh, the, the ephemeral anima, you would say, um, and that, of course, disrupting his um, self-like personality, shall we say. And uh, and then you've got this kind of scene in, in Doomsday where they're both, of course, on the opposite side of the void, Rose in the parallel universe and doc the Doctor in, in this universe. And uh, we see this kind of tearing apart of the, the anima and the animus across this void. And that is a very, very archetypal um, motif there. Very, very archetypal, actually. And uh, so things like that can can have, you know, have associations. And there's many, many and the tiniest little, uh, tiniest little things as well. Uh, 
from the show and things that popped up and also as I say in relation and this is the take home message and I've wrote a lot about this down in my dream diary the associations that I would make in my spontaneous act of imagination they would be directly so the, the images that were coloured by characters in Doctor Who whether it be River Song, Missy, the Doctor, Rose, Martha, Donna, whoever it be, the associations and the fundamental basic meaning of those characters and what they're portraying in those scenes directly related in a subjective meaning-based manner to the things that were going on with the individuals in my own life. Because, of course, the act of imagination was spontaneous. And so the archetypes were coming up to show me in this act of imagination using a language that I am aware of, which is uh, the language of Doctor Who, shall we say, my archetypal associations and the things that I need to pick up on and make conscious so that then I don't have too much of a one-sided attitude. For example, I'm not too much in the anima or I'm not too much in the animus or I'm not too much in the shadow or I'm not having my psychology misbalanced because of something that's happening in my life and that is very very prominent and it's exactly what Jung talked about when he was talking about the fact that dreams communicate with us in the language that we can most best understand and if my brain has access to Doctor Who, and that's what it most easily connects with and most easily understands from a, what we would say in behavioral terms, from a positive reinforcement of that particular thing in my life, then of course the dreams and the visions and all the rest of it are going to use that. Now, aside from that, as I was talking about before, you know, uh, TV shows, things like that can come into dreams and stuff. This can also happen on a very kind of short-term time scale. So I've noticed many, many times on, God, it must be over 100 dreams or something now. If it's not over 100, it's at least well over 50 dreams. And um, this is this idea of when I'm watching TV shows, not all the time, but a good percentage of the time, um, I'm not, I was going to put a percentage on it, but I won't because I don't know exactly. I, I, I would be guessing, but a good percentage of the time, I have dreams. Let's say I'm watching a TV series and it's a seven series show and I'm watching it over a number of, uh, over a number of weeks, three or four weeks. Then I will have dreams centered around that for that time period and then maybe they'll go away a bit might come back a little bit but not much they'll generally go away to a good extent might you know you might a month or two later you might get one or two more dream centered around it but generally they'll fade away and you might get a dream based on a new tv show or maybe you might just get dreams again based on your your everyday life you know there's a certain flow in there uh, and of course if you're not watching tv then you the, the psyche is going to arrange the dream as uh, around the organization of memories that you've had in the immediate environment over the last few days, the last week, whatever. Uh, and of course, very, very old memories can come into dreams and things like that. But getting back to the TV show, so on a more short term basis, you can also get this. And it's very, very interesting, very curious, the ideas of the psyche that it will organize the TV shows and your own personal perceptions and understanding of what you uh, project onto those, t onto those figures in the TV show in terms of archetypal associations. It will present those figures in the dream and it will perfect perfectly, once again, if you interpret the dreams based on those archetypal associations, how you understand those figures and what they mean in reality, uh, it will perfectly be centered around 
things in your life um, that are needing to be um, looked at. And it will do that from those personalized images of those TV characters that are representative of archetypal forms. And it's very, very interesting. And you can then really start to do some good interpretation because, of course, if I know that when I'm confronted with a certain TV figure in my dream, I know already that that TV show, what that TV figure really represents for me because I know what that TV show or what that figure, that character from that TV show is like in the TV show. So I can look at that TV show and I can think, well, that's their character profile. So all I need to do is base, base any interpretation of the dream off their particular character profile as relating to my understanding and my perception of that character profile. And then I can work through that and I can see based on the structure of the dream and as related to my outer life as well and my actual life of what's happening, I can think, oh, right, I know now that this is the association and this is the archetype that's lacking this is the archetype that's overabundant. This is the, the archetypal motif or the, the theme in my life that, oh, actually, I need to step back from. This is something that I'm fearful of and that I need to jump into. I need to die to, as uh, Anelia Yafoy would say, um, in terms of uh, individuation being a, a dying to life and jumping into your fears. And... Uh, so that is very, very helpful. So in the 21st century, with regards to Jungian psychology, this is the ultimate thing that I'm getting onto, and, and uh, this is where I'll sort of wrap up as well. In Jungian psychology, we have this beautiful repertoire of hundreds of TV shows and hundreds of different things. We've got all of this uh, all of these sense perceptions coming into us, all of these different modes of being, modes of, um, well, characters, things like that, all of these characters coming into us. And uh, there's so much rich archetypal material there to sink our teeth into and to, to understand. Now, of course, you don't need to interpret your dreams to understand the archetypal um, foundations of these TV shows. And of course, you could write numerous books on Doctor Who, on Star Wars, on Harry Potter, on whatever TV show you blooming want. It can be friends or it can be, um, sitcoms of all sorts of descriptions because the archetypes are in every show. They just come out in different ways. And in some shows, they're more prominent and you can see them more and they're more of the mythological based shows and films and franchises. But in other shows, they're still there and you can interpret. So you could write numerous amounts of books on the ways in which the archetypes are, are playing within the modern world in these shows. And of course, all of the writers of these shows, as I've said very blatantly and obviously before, they write from their imagination. In fact, a lot of writers, uh, especially fantasy writers, will do a, a form of active imagination. Now, they may not be familiar with the Jungian concept of the words of a term active imagination, but that's what they're doing. They'll sit on the bed, they'll go into a meditative state, and they'll let their characters come to them and formulate ideas and stories in their mind, which then will write down. And you see, that's coming directly from the psyche. Now, even if they don't do that, which some writers don't, but a lot of writers will tell you they'll do some sort of form of that, even if it's not that specifically, but there'll be some form of it. But even if they don't do that, as they're writing down, they're having little fantasies in their mind about the stories that they're portraying anyway on the page of their fantasy characters. And that is the archetypes playing, you see. That's the archetypes coming in the individualized form of these characters 
and then actually placing themselves on the page through that person, through the ego of that person. And then they produce the television show or the, the, the film or the movie or the franchise, and you can see the archetypes clear as day. Now, of course, we get um, the understanding that if those individuals who are writers are really going quite deep into their unconscious to pull out these these characters and these fantasies, then the deeper we should be able to see the archetypal motifs. And not only that, but the deeper we should be able to see possible outlooks and intuitions on the future from the these archetypal themes within these TV shows and within these movies. As I say, especially the very, very highly... Uh, fantasy like ones because of course just like in dreaming we can have pers what's known as perspective dreams which are future dreams which tell us something uh, about the future and then we end up two days later or a week later or three weeks later having a scenario in reality that is eerily similar to the dream scenario and that's what we could very easily say uh, very obviously a perspective dream a future dream then uh, we can see this in the TV shows. And if, as I say, the person is very close to the collective unconscious, I think here are things like the, the writers of Rick and Morty and stuff like that, those guys are very, very close, very, very imaginative and can go very close to the collective unconscious, uh, specifically the, the co-creators of it, uh, Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland, I believe, um, those two specifically, because they're really the drive, the, the imaginative driving force behind it. The others, the other writers, of course, are, are a great team, uh, and, uh, and will be able to get quite close to the collective unconscious as well. But those two specifically have got very good mind, very sharp mind on them. Um, and so, of course, uh, I think specifically that, but also many, many other shows as well. Um, and then we can start to see very, very, scarily in a sense within these shows the way in which the future is going to form itself from fantasy or the way in which the future could form itself from fantasy because of course there's many different routes that the future could take causally causally speaking there's many different ways it could manifest itself so it's only sort of a one particular route that could take place um but nonetheless it is a route that could t take place so of course when we get a, and i've talked about this briefly before but when we get a lot of movies and tv shows talking about uh robot takeovers and things like this this isn't just you know not serious stuff this isn't just, oh, well, a movie's being produced on the robot takeover. How fun is that? Oh, yeah, that'll never happen. But people think it's like that. But no, that comes from the depths of the psyche. That's a potential reality for expression. That's a potential reality for the collective of mankind if we move in a particular way to uh, actually uh, get closer towards now, personally, do I think there's going to be a robot takeover as such? No, I don't believe that. Do I believe that there's going to be some very, very, very high level of integration between humans and robots at some point in the future? Yes, I very much full, fully believe that. And so, therefore, the question becomes, well, we do have to be careful uh, about how that comes along and how that uh, is... is uh, displayed and is played out in society. And the fantasies of today and the ways in which these creatives are coming out with these wonderful pieces of artwork as well, because it can, can be expressed in art or, of course, TV shows and poetry and all the rest of it. Uh, the way in which it's being expressed today needs to be taken seriously because it is not just a frivolous outpouring of creativity that means nothing at the end of the day. It comes from the depths of the psyche and it is a potential reality. It is a potential reality. Now, how can we possibly say 
that the psyche, that the mind is real. How is that possible to say that the psyche of the mind is real? Because so many people, now Jung was a proponent of the, the reality of the psyche. And I never understood. No, well, I did understand that, but I didn't understand it in the way I understand it now. I was always very open to, uh, well, since not, not always, because in high school I, I really wasn't. I was very much a strict skeptic and I was very atheistic. I was like, no, 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 there's nothing spiritual or mystical. That's all, did it? You know, nonsense and all, this, all the rest of it. Um, I may have been sympathetic to spirituality or mysticism in a kind of, you know, ha-ha way, but I was never um, sympathetic to it in a, oh, I'm going to take this serious way. But I did always have an intuition about uh, dreams and things being something. I remember when I was 14, 13 or 14, I had a wonderful collective archetypal dream of... Uh, Basically, um, the end of the world, and there were, you know, it's typical uh, apocalypse uh, scene, uh, and, and there was these big, bold, giant asteroid type boulders coming down from the sky, and there was red skies, and uh, you know, it was like a, a apocalyptic scenes on the ground, and there was this wise old woman um, who I uh, I had done a little bit of research on to. Um, mystical figures in that time about 13 14 and uh, i had done a little bit of research on uh the mayan calendar and on terence B terence mckenna's um ideas in the mayan calendar of, of the mayan calendar being ending at tw in, in 2012 on the 21st of december of course mckenna actually i later realized said that obviously it may not have been that date but it could have been any date and uh I'm not really particularly one for um, doomsday predict predictions or any anything like that. That's a little bit far far fetched for me. Particularly, I'm not saying that we're not in any sort of end times now or anything like that. Very very possible that we are approaching some sort of end times based on my observations of the psyche and things like that. And anyone who's done any observing of the psyche will know very obviously that there can be that kind of uh, approaching. I was never really too sympathetic to that, but I was doing some uh, research, of course, on that at the time. And also uh, someone called Mother Shipman, who was like a, a you know, a mystic, um, not a medicine woman, but what would you say? Sort of like a, I don't know how to say, a psychic or something like that. And uh, I kind of had her pop up in my dream as well. And she's represented it, representative of a wise old woman archetype, of course. And uh, she was in there and stuff. Um, but no, the reality of the psyche it is real. Now, how the hell can we define it as real? Well, imagine that you have uh, certain fantasies that pop up. Now, those fantasies only pop up. As a fight, as a physical, a physiological firing of of your neurons in the brain, and if we're going off some sort of idea of Spinoza's dual aspect monism, uh, in brackets monism for those who like to pronounce it that way, um, if we're going off some idea of that, with the brain and the mind being one substance and uh, the same thing looked at in two different dimensions of experience, which let me tell you from my observation, seemed to be incredibly accurate. And it was Albert Einstein who actually said that the, the uh, pantheism, I know this doesn't directly relate to dual aspect monoism, although partially indirectly it may. Um, Albert Einstein said that the one of the most beautiful philosophies, or one of the most uh, wonderful philosophers, was Spinoza and his pantheism. And I really agree with that. I mean, since I've looked into Spinoza's pan pantheism, because, of course, you kind of get led on to that uh, when you're looking into Jungian psychology. And when you go deeper on Jungian psychology and you start looking into the psychoid nature of the archetypes, uh, which is the physiological nature of the archetypes and how the archetypes have impact on your physiology as well as on your psychology, uh, then we start to see... Um, the, the Jungian idea of the psychoid nature of the archetypes is very much 
a souped up version, a souped up 20th century version of Spinoza's, I want to say, 17th century um, idea of dual aspect monoism. I think it was 17th century Spinoza anyway. Descartes was uh, 17th century, so maybe uh, 16th, 17th century. So I think it was 17th century. Uh, you'll have to excuse me because I do get my dates wrong sometimes. I do believe that is correct. I do get my dates wrong sometimes because uh, if you know me, you'll know that there is a, a hell of a lot of stuff inside my head. So it's like being in a, a mental factory that's that's been pumped full of foam. You know, in uh, Willy Wonka, when we're going, when we're in that little car in the 1971 version with G Gene Wilder, we're in that blooming really eccentric car that, of course, G Gene Wilder is an archetypal association in, in that role is uh, associated with the Joker or trickster archetype, and it's very, very interesting archetypal association. But we got in that blooming weird eccentric car, and we're going through that the machine or whatever, and we get covered in foam. It's almost like I'm a big imagination factory in my mind or a big factory of ideas in my mind and it's just full of foam and I can't even see anything in there because there's just too many ideas going on. Uh, that's what it's like to be. It's, it's horrible. It's horrible. And anyone high in trait openness will uh, obviously agree, me, agree with me when I say that. I mean, it's wonderful. Don't get me wrong. It's brilliant. It's, I, I adore it. But at the same time, it's horrible because it's like this amazing imagination factory of of ideas and associations and philosophy and psychology and God knows what else. Um, but yeah, when you go into that, uh, in terms of Jungian idea, you, you see that kind of um, uh, those associations coming through there. And so um, with regards to kind of this reality of the psyche, it's very true that these images do, in fact, um, have a relationship with our physiology. And of course, whenever we get a thought and then we, let's say, we dismiss a thought uh, or we suppress a thought or we repress a thought, when that comes up as a fire in a, as a physical firing of the neurons in the hippocampus and, of course, the emotional association that comes from that in the amygdala, um, we, uh, and maybe some associations in our, our olfaction and in other areas of the brain, of course, in language and things like that. Um, but when we get that association and then let's say we suppress it or we repress it, then that's a, a thought that has gone directly back into our physical body in the hippocampus. It's physically there in the hippocampus in a very, very minute way of course in in a storage manner in the hippocampus and so that particular fantasy that's there as a as a mental phenomenon uh is a physical phenomenon as well it goes into the physical realm in fact the two are synonymous in fact at the exact production of that thought from the neurons the mental sphere isn't different from the phys physical fit sphere it looks different. It per we perceive it as different, but it's in fact one and the same process. It's both physical and mental. It's physical hyphen men mental hyphen. Me it's like causality. Uh, it's cause hyphen effect. It's not cause and effect because you can't have a cause without an effect. So it's cause hyphen effect. It's non-dual. It's that kind of way of thinking. And of course, there's a lot about that in Jung, and there's a lot about that in Spinoza as well. And so we're on that kind of wavelength of philosophy, and it's very true when you look into it in enough detail. Now, also, we could say, well, well, okay, Adam, so that cements the psyche in reality somewhat, but you know, I mean, it doesn't doesn't really mean it's like fully real, does it? Come on, I mean. It doesn't really mean it's real. Okay, so you're telling me that let's say you have these certain associations and you get these certain fantasies and maybe those fantasies are relating to a bad situation that you had in childhood that created these fantasies of the, the particular uh, environment that you were in that was negative. You repressed those fantasies as kind of images in your mind. You repressed those. They went into your hippocampus. You had multiple experience, bad experiences over your childhood. You repressed all of those as well. They all went into your hippocampus. And okay, let's say that you're now 22 years old and you're approaching a man on the street and he comes up and he's a bit 
pretty burly man. Maybe he's got a leather jacket on like me, but he's quite, a, you know, he's not like me in, in uh, my kind of anatomy. I'm quite a skinny guy. Let's say he's quite a big, bold, muscly guy. Maybe he comes up to you and starts randomly being assertive with you. Then you get all of this neurophysiology firing and you get all of those uh, repressed memories that have formed that complex over, over, reinforced over a number of years that then give you a, a real, really, really overly pronounced fight, fight or flight response that then orients your behavior. And then you can say, well, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I see that, that the fantasies have actually cemented themselves in the physiology, in the neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, and based on the environment as well, based on an arrangement of that, and also just over time, um, uh, there's been certain physical and behavioral um, tendencies in the physical world, in reality, from those particular repressed imaginations, fantasies, things like that. You might say, okay, okay, you know, that's, that's fair enough. And you might, you know, you might say, well, that's fair enough. But then, but then you might also, but then some people might think, well, I don't know really. It's a bit, you know, isn't it a bit airy fairy still? Is it still not quite cemented for you? Um, so let's cement it a little bit more. Let's go into this because this is what I've done. I like to, I go into things to a good depth and, and, and this isn't the level of depth that I've gone into them because Jordan Peterson makes a brilliant point. He says, if you want to talk on a subject and you want to talk on it well, you have to know three times as much about that subject as the stuff you're going to talk about. So imagine here that I can only talk about in a level of depth three times less than what I actually know. And that's very true because there's so many things right now that I want to talk to you about. There's so much more depth that I want to go into because I know it. But the problem is I can't formulate it in instructed arguments yet because I've not got enough knowledge um, added on to that to be able to give you that full amount of knowledge that I have. It's not structured enough. It's not cemented enough in my um, brain and in my ideas. But let's just say about this, right? So you have a dream and you have some fantasies in your dream and then you wake up and you're sweating and you're, you've had a nightmare and, and you're sweating profusely. Uh, I don't know. You might even have goosebumps or something like that. I don't, I don't know. It could be anything. Uh, you've got some, some physiological reactions are clearly happening here anyway. So, I mean, right there, of course, you can see that the, 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 the imaginative realm, the fantasy realm, the mental realm of dream images is having an impact on, on reality, on the physiological realm. It's having an impact. Then unconsciously, or well, not really unconsciously, but unconscious of the, how the dream has directed your behavior, shall we say, you straight away get up and go to the bathroom and you, you have to have a drink and you have a drink. And you maybe damp yourself off, sprinkle a bit of water on your face or whatever, get rid of that sweat, and then you go back to bed. The, the dream has completely oriented your behavior there. All of your physiology, all of your physiological reactions, well, not all of them, because of course there's many other physiological reactions going on unconsciously to you in your body, but all of the kind of more overt physiological reactions and your behavior has been, it has been transformed by the dream images, has been transformed by what happened in the dream because you had a nightmare and now you got you got physiological reactions and so you go to the toilet. And let's say that in the dream you had a dream about some sort of possessive woman. I've had that before. You have a dream of the possessive aspects of the feminine encapsulated within this kind of demonic figure. And it's, you know, obviously, traditionally, people call it a nightmare. I don't have nightmares anymore because... I don't call them nightmares. To me, it's all just dreaming and there's all just associations I can make from it. So whether it's a nightmare, whether it's a dream, it, 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 it makes no odds to me, really. I think that nightmare is just a, um, a redundant phrase for a dream interpreter. It's all just dreams and it's all just what you can interpret. But let's say you have that. Then that dream figure, that actual fantasy figure in your dream has actually changed your physiology and your behavior. There's, there's no um, throwing that away. That is, that is what's happened 
That is what's happened. That dream and the structure of that dream and the figures in that dream and the way in which that dream kind of presented itself to you has changed the physical world. It has changed the physical world. And that causally goes to affect all other things in your day. Because when you've got up, let, let's say you get up in the morning from a dream like that, and then you go to the toilet, uh, you go to the, sorry, you go to the bathroom and you sprinkle that water on your face. Because it's affected your behavior in that, that moment, then your entire causal, uh, relationship with the physical world has changed. Because instead of you getting up without sweating and, and just going to, going out the door, uh, a sooner time period, you now go out the door later. And then you may miss your bus. Okay, so now you've missed your bus. Now you don't get into work on time. You have to ring up someone to get you into work because the next bus is going to be far too late. And so you, you, you get into work and you may be five or ten minutes late. Then your boss says, why weren't you in today? Why weren't you in, uh, you know, on time? And you see what's happened. The dream, because of that subtle little thing, has manifested all this behavior. Now, of course, I'm exaggerating there because it probably wouldn't be that sweating out of a dream would change your causal history that much. But of course, we have to exaggerate to try and get the point across. The fact is that sweating will change your causal history to a finite degree. And, and that will orient your, um, all of your uh, next steps of behavior in a very, very subtle way. It will orient your, the conversations with people. And of course, I've talked about the brilliant research by Dr. Dylan Sel Slelterman, um, who has actually proven scientifically, that, well, I say pro we shouldn't say proven in science, but I like to say it anyway, but really you could only ever say proven if the results are, uh, are replicated like a thousand times and it's like really, really cemented. Then you could say proven. But let me rephrase that anyway to be more scientific. The research that Dr. Dylan Slelterman has done and has, the things that he's found out um, would suggest that dreams um, actually impact behavior. So, for example... Uh, he did some research and he got people to uh, write down uh, and, and analyze, well, not analyze the dreams, but basically um, collate their dreams, uh, specifically when they have dreams of their sexual partners, their romantic partners, etc. And when those people had dreams, negative dreams of their sexual partners, romantic partners, um, maybe they had a dream with them going off with another guy. Or maybe they had a dream about them themselves going off with, with another woman or something. Then the next day, their behavior with their significant other, with their romantic partner, would be a little bit more negative. Unconsciously, of course. This is an unconscious thing. Would be colored a little bit more negatively. Now, of course, we would say in a Jungian view, that's the archetypes working in the dream and coloring their... Uh, the unconsciously colouring the behaviour in the day, of course, that's quite natural from a Jungian view to say that. Um, maybe the anima, the animus, whatever, you know, it's coloured that particular set of behaviour. And then, of course, when that man approaches the external anima, which is his, his wife, the external appearance of the anima, shall we say, he then gets a ne slight negative association with that because of a negative dream the night before. But of course, Dr. Dylan Slalterman has, has shown this, has found this. And of course, if you have a positive dream equally of your romantic partner, you will be more affectionate or you will maybe not more affectionate, but you'll you'll just see them more in a positive light. And that will go to affect your behavior. So, of course, it's very, very obvious the reality of the psyche. But will people take this seriously when they have a fantasy? Let's say they're walking down the street. Some, for some reason, a spontaneous image comes in your mind, a spontaneous scene. We all have this from time to time. I don't even care if you're incredibly low in trait openness or you hardly ever think in images. At one time or another, you will have at least had this once or twice. You're walking down the street and an image just pops into your mind, some random thought, and then you, 
you know, you, you kind of create this fantasy in your mind when you're walking down the street. And then suddenly you've walked past the blooming crossing that you were meant to cross, or maybe not quite that obvious. Maybe you've just stumbled a little bit, just as if, let's say, you were, you were looking at your phone when you're in that kind of fantasy world, just thinking about something. Maybe you're thinking about, oh, uh, oh, we, you know, we really need to get the keys to that, to the house sorted. So I'm buying a new house soon and I need to get the keys sorted. And so you kind of, you, you're kind of off in this little fantasy realm, which is in the kind of semi-conscious. There's this fantasy there of w where you can see your new house and you can see your partner and you're thinking, oh, we need to get the keys for that house and stuff. And so you're busy in that fantasy and you're just kind of automatically walking down the street. You're in neuro and, uh, neurophysiological terms would say your, your cerebellum's taking over on autopilot, walking down the street like that um, while you're fantasizing like that. And, uh, and then suddenly, you know, you just end up stumbling a bit or you walk, you're walking a bit like that because you're too deep in the fantasy. And that causally affects reality. And that has minute manifestations for all other things in that environment. And all the other people are doing this as well. And so the psyche is equally, if not more so, the images and the fantasies of, of mental life are equally or more so affecting reality just as the physical world would do, just as me picking up a, a cup would do physically. And think about it. Of course, we know this. Very, very basic terms. I have to have the idea in my mind to pick up that cup before I can pick it up. I have to have, I have to look at that cup, have the word in my mind or have an image in my mind, even if that's unconscious to me. But I have to have that I unconscious or, or even conscious idea to be able to pick it up physically. So, of course, we know that there, that you have to do that. And that, of course, in Jungian psychology, we, we call that the, the will and the idea, or the rule and the idea, which is, of course, another way in ungendered terms of describing the animus and the anima, the animus being the will, the anima being the idea. And, of course, this is Sch uh, Schopenhauer's philosophy of the, um, well, the world as will and representation, but specifically the, the will and idea as well within that philosophy of, of everything manifest, everything in the universe being um, a, a union of this will and idea. I, you see, so I can give you a very, very, very brief example. I have the idea first of picking up this charging bank. And then because I've got a will, because I've got an actual will, a man, you know, I can, I can pick up that, that charger. I've then pick it up. So that's, that, that action there is a manifestation of, of the will and the idea, a union of the will and the idea. And that is also a union of the anima and the animus, or, or, well, if we're going respectively, the will, animus, idea, anima. And so that's how the entirety of the universe, of course, as I've touched upon before, is a union of the anima and the animus. And this can be seen in all aspects, whether it's uh, uh, in ax axonal... Have I got that right? Yeah, axonal conduction in the brain with so sodium and potassium, whether it's in... Um, what should, what else should we say? What else could we call upon? There's many, many different things. Um, in terms of batteries with positive and negative charge, things like that. Um, with chemical reactions specifically that one is an active chemical, one may be a passive chemical, all these sorts of things. There's like many, many different things that we could call upon, uh, that, uh, show us this kind of interrelation of the will. And the idea and that, that kind of um, process between them. And of course, we could even say something like the Big Bang. We have to have the will of the Big Bang. We have to have that, that, that actual energy. But we also have to have the idea to create the planets and the things like that in the, in the first place. They are uh, a representation of the will, shall we say. The planets and all the rest of it, the galaxies and the stars and all. They're like a representation of the will. And they're, they're kind of an illusionary representation of the will. Uh, in physics, we'd say, of course, you know, if the universe is made up of a, a certain energy, shall we say, 
and we can say in whatever, whatever terms we're going to say that in string theory. Okay. So the in very basic terms, the universe is uh, made up of vibrating strings in certain arrangements that form different particles or whatever it may be. Uh, and, and th those then produce, you know, sort of for not in the end produce certain phenomena. Um, but that's of course illusionary. Because ultimately, these phenomena change and this energy changes into different things. So um, we say that things in the universe are illusionary in that way because, of course, they are um, based on this change in energy. Or we say, like, well, you know, uh, the universe is, is some sort of energy, is some sort of solidified light, which may be made up of um, wave particle duality. And uh, then in that particular circumstance, um, of course, the energy we know to, to be changing over time. And we know that energy in, um, I think it's one of the laws of thermodynamics, Any, energy uh, can't be created or destroyed. There is a little caveat in quantum mechanics where on a very, 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 very small basis, energy can be created or destroyed, but generally not created or destroyed. And I'm not a physicist. I'm just stating the very, very basic knowledge that I've, that I've looked at. Um, but, you know, but this energy changes over time. And so that, that the will, let's say the will as a fundamental thing can't really ever be known. You could only set, you could only peg it down to, some sort of stuff, you know, you could only say, well, it's some sort of stuff. That's as best we can ever do for it. Um, but we see arising from the will, all of this representation and all of this kind of illusionary things, you know, um, and therefore really there can never be a thing in itself. There can only ever be the illusion of what the will provides. The thing in itself, you would say, well, maybe it is the will. But what is the will? You know, so there you go. Um, but all of these things, the planets, all the rest of it, are illusions. They're, a, they're um, uh, an idea, a representation based on this just energy that's able to manifest itself in all different ways. Um, but anyway, we've gone sufficiently deep there. I'll, I'll leave it there for this one. I hope you enjoyed this video, guys. That was just a, uh, a look, uh, well, we've covered all sorts of stuff there. We've covered the individualized version of the psyche and how it kind of, um, manifests in, through the individual and unique brain. We've covered, covered a little bit on philosophy and how that interrelates with certain concepts in Jungian psychology. We've, we've covered the reality of the psyche, uh, as interrelated with the physical and physiological realm. Um, which is very interesting and as related to causality. Uh, we've covered a little bit on how fantasy can shape the future. And we've also covered indirectly, although we didn't touch upon it directly, but it was in there indirectly, the law of attraction and things like that. There's, there's a bit of the law of attraction in this video. And, uh, we've of course touched upon a little bit about dreaming there as well and how dreaming can affect our behavior and, uh, certain things, uh, certain nature of dreams as well. So I hope you enjoyed this video, guys. I am going to go out for a walk. Now it's half four. Go out for a walk and then I will grab my tea. If you did enjoy it, then whack a like on it or the rest of it. I don't normally say anything like that, but since I'm doing a, um, a more formal end to the video, I suppose, like I, I don't really normally do too much of a lengthy outro, but since I'm doing this, uh, yeah, give, you know, whack a like on the video. Uh, and if obviously, if anyone wants to know anything um, in depth about Jungian psychology, uh, then just message me. I do not know. Um, uh, how do I even explain this? I do not know a great deal because there's always more to know with Jungian psych. You never know whether you, whether you whether you've got there or whether you haven't. It's like something like Zen or. I suppose with Zen, there's more markers because you've got koans that you can mark yourself with and say, oh, well, do I know about the sound of one hand clapping or do I know about this? Do I, do I understand that now in experience? So I suppose with Zen, it's a bit easier. But with Jungian psychology, there's always more depth to go. You're always unconscious of yourself. So I can never make the very bold statement that, oh, yes, well, uh, you know, I know about this because as soon as you do that, 
you you landed in it. And of course, um, the psychiatrist Joe Wheelwright, who uh, uh, was very prominent in, in the dissemination of uh, Jung's ideas in the early days in uh, the 30s and the 40s, who took Jung's ideas to America and set up a um, uh, an analytic practice over in America and a um, Jung Society over in America. I don't know whether it was specifically called the Society, but um, he, he set up uh, kind of a group for, for Jungians over in America. Uh, when he was leaving Jung for the last time, Jung said, uh, so everyone's going to love you now, uh, we all right, and uh, make sure that when you do notice that people are going to love you, that's when you've got to be the most um, astute. That's when you've got to be the most wise, because if you're not, that's when you'll fall. And what he was talking about, of course, is um, the possession by the shaman archetype, by the wise old man archetype, that, that kind of thing that lends itself to uh, someone who has a lot of knowledge who has a lot of spiritual knowledge, a lot of intuitive knowledge, a lot of, of course, knowledge on the body, which we all right did have because he was a psychiatrist, that lends itself to coming in and then you get possessed by it. And if you're possessed by it, it's gone. It's gone. And then you're unconscious. And then what are you going to do? So it's very, very, very important to keep centered to keep an eye on those archetypes on what's possessing you because of course when you get possessed by the shaman then the delusions of grandeur increase things like that increase all the stuff like that comes up so um that's the Jungian way send that if you want a real condense of the Jungian way it's a centeredness within the context of an individualized personality the centeredness of yourself within a, within the context of an individualized personality that isn't being permeated by archetypes all the time of course we do get permeated by archetypes they do come through us they do um uh, affect our behavior and things like that um but to have some sort of centeredness, that's always good. Now, you know my thoughts on the whole centeredness. I do believe that uh, in the Jungian idea, we should express ourselves uh, or the archetypes should kind of have a place within, within us. And we shouldn't necessarily just be stone golems or stone Buddhas, if you will, if, in, a, in a Buddhist terminology. Um, we shouldn't be like that. But... Um, but still, we should have some level of centeredness and we still should have some level of being centered in an individualized personality. And we, we shouldn't just unnecessarily let all the archetypes flow for us uh, or anything like that. We shouldn't be unconscious of ourselves, particularly. Um, but anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching, guys, and I will see you in the next one. So see you very soon, guys.